Hi, I'm Rhea Dinas of Techie Books. I thought I would do a brief introduction to this audio. Alan Smith of Champagne Books and I were asked to do a panel on audiobooks for When Words Collide 2015. Together with narrators Tony King and Crystal McWhorter, we put this together. Most of the panel ended up being questions from the audience. In fact, we had more questions than we had time, so if you have any other questions, feel free to contact either myself at Tyke Books or Ellen at Champagne Books. As the audience wasn't mic'd, I re-recorded their questions at a later date and cut them in for clarity. Thank you for listening. It is 102. <laughs> One of our narrators unfortunately got the address wrong, so he's not going to be able to make it. He's at the sentry box right now. <laughs> <laughs> so he's probably playing a nice game. Yes. So, and I have a outline. We're all going to introduce ourselves. We're going to do a five-minute spiel each on how we deal with it. We have two publishers and two narrators. And then we will do a little talk, and then we'll do a Q&A. Does that work for everybody? Obviously, I'm the one talking the most. Please, please don't let me do that. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? You're doing such a good job. I'm not sure what our audience is like. Are we authors looking to get books narrated? Are we hoping to be narrated narrators or just interested? Just interested. An author hoping to get published, but always been keen on books that are narrated. Okay. And love to try narrating. Actually, have narrated a book for a friend who was bedridden, and you know, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Ellen and I take very two different approaches to it. That's why we thought we would have two of us come as publishers. Um, so anyways, I'm Rhea. I'm with Taiki Books. Among my other things, I'm head of the audiobook <laughs> section of Taiki Books. We'll go, we'll go this way, except for me, because I'm always first. <laughs> uh, I'm Tony King. I uh, have committed one audiobook. Uh, for Taiki Books. It is uh, Helix, A Blight of Exiles by Patricia Flewelling, which uh, is available in the dealer's room now. Uh, I did that over the winter. It was my first attempt at it. I, I read for a living uh, because I do early morning radio for News Talk 770 here in Calgary. So I, I work a lot with microphones, but reading a book is a completely different experience. You're just introducing yourself right now. Oh, okay. It's not your five-minute oh, spiel. Oh, it's not my five-minute <laughs> spiel. Okay. All right. Well, why didn't He's you Tony just say, King. here's Tony King? Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll get back to you. Okay. You're next after the... I'm Ellen. I am the publisher of the Champagne Book Group. I've been doing this for 10 years now, and just in the last year and a bit, we have branched into audio. I'm Kristen McWhorter. I am a narrator. I've done two audiobooks, working on the third. Um, with Taiki, and yeah, I'm a theater person, um, long time actor, so it's kind of it kind of seemed like a natural. No, I'm sorry. Now you can continue. Now I can continue. Okay. <laughs> Where was I? Reading a book is totally different from reading a newscast or doing a live show on the radio, and it doesn't really matter if it's you know. The words of somebody else or, or my own words. I had, I have been reading books aloud for 30 years because, well, 34 years because my son is 35 this year. So, uh, we started reading to him very young and, uh, right up until my daughter was in her early twenties, we were reading books aloud because my daughter loved to hear me read. My wife likes to hear me read. Um, he has and that so, radio voice. <laughs> yes, I do. I have a radio voice. Um, <clears throat> so I always wanted it. It was on my bucket list to to do uh, an audio book, um, something. And I never really had any hope that it would ever happen. I Not something that I actively pursued until last year at When Words Collide. There was a panel about doing audio books. And Rhea was talking about how they're looking for readers all the time. Okay, well... Here I am. I would love to try it. So I've done one. I must have done all right because they asked me to do a second. I don't, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't call myself an, an actor. It's a, it's a dramatic reading. I try to, you know, make sure that the, the voices are uh, distinct and delineated. They are the voices that I hear in my head when I read the book the first time. 
Um, I, you know, in the case of the book that I'm doing right now, City of Demons, uh, by Kevin Harkness, it's uh, I. I did ask him for pronunciations on some of the names because some of them occurred to me in my head and they're stuck that way, even though they're the wrong pronunciation. So I've had to go back and redo some of them. But um, ordinarily, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, a trained actor or anything like that. I don't, don't profess to, to be, you know, acting these books. I'm just doing a dramatic reading. I, I try to make it as entertaining as I can. Like I say, Rhea's given me a second book to do, so presumably I entertained her. Well, the author really liked Pat. Really liked yes. his reading. That that was Felix. actually the biggest rush of all was seeing Pat's uh, reaction on her blog. It was O M G, you guys, you have to hear this. Okay, <laughs> well, I like that. <laughs> Anytime you get an ego stroke, it's great. So we will go. To, I'll do. I'll go last. Because I, I, I tend to know. She's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, our approach to audio is, as Rhea says, a little different from her approach. We tend to hire a producer that prepares our entire audiobook. So they read it first. Usually we suggest they read it first. So And most, I think most narrators do that. Don't they read it first? Um, so that you you get a feel for the the book and the characters and then they do whatever they do behind the scenes they uh, prepare all the files narrate it um, edit it and give me the final files which then we send out to our distributors and put up for sale um, one of the things that we do though um, once they've they've finished their bit they send them to us we do review them and it takes it it does take a very long time to produce a good audiobook the quality has to be really good the sound has to be good there has to be no little noises in the background and we actually listen to it with an audio program so that we can actually see as the author or the uh, narrator is reading along any blips or problems in the background Do you do that as well um, yeah, you open it up. We use Audacity. I don't know which one you use. Actually, I use Audacity as well. Okay. I have another one too called Gold Wave, but yeah. I use Audacity mostly. And you can see, you can see if there's any background noises that might show up later on or other problems. So it's a lot of, no, this isn't quite right. You know, these are the problems. This is where I see them. Go back and fix them. And eventually we get this final file and it takes a good, I would say, a couple of hours per finished hour that we receive just to review and then it goes back to the narrator to do the final stuff before it comes to us they tell me it takes about four to six hours of work per finished hour so it's a very long process yeah and that's it you have more minutes that's not five minutes i, I don't know that's what else fine. to say right now yes um what is a different form like if i'm driving down the highway and i want to listen to an audio book would i get this what are the different forms of audiobook? If I'm driving down the highway, would I get it as a CD or? There's several different formats. Um, the big one is Audible, which is owned by Amazon. Um, they do a subscription or a purchase. Like, like my husband is through Audible and he does once a month, they take a certain amount off his credit card and he can buy one book worth, unless it's a really long one, then he has to get two credits, as it were. Or you can just buy the audiobook through them. They're the big one. Um, we sell them here. We have CDs, flash drives also. Um, you can get them through iTunes. Uh, you can go, there, there's several markets for them, uh, that, but they almost all ask for MP3 formats, usually higher end. Um, Audible, uh, Audible, believe it or not, like mono 128 K KPS MP3 formats. And they want it divided by chapters. We will go over all of that in a few minutes. So I'll just, I'll let the dynamic readers talk and give you ours. But yeah, it's here in our guideline because we know get, doing the audiobook is, is fine, but it's afterwards dealing with the markets. <laughs> It's like banging your head against the wall. It feels so good when it stops. Yeah. It's just, it really is, especially here in Canada. Mm. In the U.S., it's not quite as bad. But here in Canada, dealing with Amazon audio is not fun. 
and we will go through it. I'll let Crystal talk a bit, and then because we approach audiobooks totally different, I'll do a little. But the market is the same for all of us. So so and with and, and yeah. So, yeah, that that's <laughs> going to be the hard part is the marketing or getting it distrib distribution order. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to talk now if that's okay. <laughs> I warned you. I'll just take the mic away. So, um, yeah, I'm working on my third audiobook with Taiki right now. Um, the So it's been a bit of a learning process. Um, I am an actor. I've been an actor all my life. Um, and I was always the kid in school who was like, I want to read it. Can I read it out loud? Can it, can it be my turn now? So that was – I've always been a reader. I've always been – enjoyed reading out loud. So it seemed when I, when I heard about them, uh, I got an email through my school for the university of Calgary being like, this company is looking for audiobook readers. And I was like, perfect. Um, so I met Rhea and that's kind of how I got in into it. Um, my first book, first two books, actually, I recorded using my phone. Um, I just have it. It works well. It, it's amazing, actually. Yeah. Like, it sounds really, really weird, but it works really, really well. The mic on your uh, headset is actually, like, it's very powerful, and it, it works. And it's designed to not give off a lot of feedback and that kind of stuff. Um, and I used a program called RecForge, um, and that's how I recorded the first two audiobooks. Uh, recently, for the third one, I actually have a microphone, um, which is a lot more powerful and took a lot more tweaking and adjustments to get it to the levels that it needed to be at to not give weird feedback or pick up background noises that I couldn't even hear um, and things like that. But it plugs directly into my laptop and then I use Audacity, which they've already it's talked a free about program and we'll discuss it. It's a great free program. Um, and I use that to do the recording with. Um, so yeah, I mean, we talked about, uh, yeah, we do, I do read, try to read the book before I start recording it. Um, I try to make notes as to what words, what names and such might not be pronounced as Tony mentioned the way I think it would be pronounced. Um, and I email the author and ask them for, you know, the correct pronunciation because, especially with fantasy, there's a lot of words that just are not innate. You know, you don't just look at it and go, oh, obviously this is pronounced this way. And sometimes when you do, you're wrong. <laughs> so I do make a list of all the names, all if there's another language that they use, that's their own language. I look that up. If there's words I don't know, um, or I'm not certain of the pronunciation for, I, I do a Google search of correct pronunciations dictionary.com is your friend yeah or youtube actually has a, a lot of yeah. of pronunciations where they'll say the word correctly and then i try to remember it because sometimes as tony mentioned i i go back to the pronunciation i had initially imagined and have to repeat it the correct way <laughs> so yeah that's that's kind of my process um then each chapter i generally do separately Unless they're really short chapters, then I might do several at once. Um, and I just go through the book progressively and, and uh, send it in to Rhea as I finish. And that's pretty much it. What happens if you speak an error in the program? Are you able to just back up a little bit? What happens if you speak an error into the program? Can you just back up and re-record over top of it? No, you have to cut it in. Yeah. You so can take the file and cut it, yeah. what I do, um, uh, Ray hasn't gone into her way of doing things yet, but what I do is I will stop. I'll repeat the sentence correctly and, and then keep going. Um, and then it can be cut out later. Um, although I admit I'm a little bit vain. So if I make a mistake in the first like one or two paragraphs, I'll just start all, of, all over again because I feel embarrassed that <laughs> I made a mistake that early on. And so I just start recording it all over again until I get the first at least couple paragraphs perfect. Um, and there are things that I miss. Um, I do have headphones that I can plug directly into my microphone so I can actually monitor how I sound as I'm recording it, which does help me catch minor... Uh, 
errors in pronunciation and things like that. Okay, so we do it completely different. We do it because of costs, and you know, small presses have a fairly shoestring budget. As Crystal just said, we did an open casting call to U U of C. We said we will pay this much, which is not much. <laughs> That's why we get students. They record it chapter by chapter. They send it in to us, and then I open up the book, put it in, put on the headphones, and I read it line by line as I'm listening to it. I'll cut out any errors. If there are errors, I will email our narrators and say. And, you know, they're minor things. You don't even realize it as you're saying it. We had um, one that I remember. The line was, he went up the hall, and blah, 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 blah. And the, and the narrator said, he went up the hill, blah, 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 blah. And you don't even notice that type of thing as you're reading it. So you have to go back and listen to it. And if you're doing voice acting, um, Crystal's mostly a narrator. Tony's sort of in between, and we were going to have and the one who is at Century Box, because he got the wrong address, does full voice acting. Sometimes they forget which voice belongs to which character, so you have to send it back and went, no, this is so-and-so's character, but you did it in this voice. So, um, so Ellen was correct. Our narrators take approximately two for one time to record it, and then it comes to me, and it takes another three for one time. So every finished hour, it takes me about three hours to edit takes them up so you've got at least close to five hours for every finished hour time to do a book yeah it's not as easy as most people think oh I'm going to open it and just narrate it not that easy and there are tips tips and tricks um, think of as a theater because when you're in a theater you announce words differently than when you're talking like tease would be you know that as opposed to that like we would mostly say and it, because it's a little different with the recording. But yeah, so we do all the ins work. We do editing. We make it into a book. And that way we pay nothing. It's our time more than anything. Because Ellen would obviously pay more because she sends it out to a producer to get it all done. But she still has her own time that she just said she mm. puts into listening to it. Yeah, I'm picky. Yeah. I'm, a picky. I'm not 100% as picky, but I don't pay what Ellen does. <laughs> And I admit it. And that's how we approach it. We will answer, what, do you want to answer a few questions and then go into marketing and sure. tips and tricks? Everybody has their own little tricks. Yes? Uh, if it was a, a non-fiction book, so it's pretty much just the, the same voice all the way through, okay. Would you then tweak the voice a little bit? If it is a non-fiction book or a book that doesn't have acting or multiple voices do you then tweak them you you can um the program that we've all used that we mentioned audacity is free and it is an amazing program and what they don't have on it you can get plugins like because when i get the recording sometimes you have your peaks and valleys so you can level it so it's more or less level in audacity um, but that's a plug-in. It has its own, but it's not as good. So you get a plug-in called um, Chris's Compressed Dynamics. And yeah, you just oh, run it through that. I hate that. <laughs> I loved the levelator. Oh. I know it's a bit, uh, it's hard to work from. Sorry, I almost swore there. That's okay. <laughs> the I levelator was one. great, but they haven't support, they supported yeah. it in five or six years. Yeah. It was another free program that you would just run your stuff and it would level it. But they don't do it anymore, so I have to use Chris's Dynamics unless you mm -hmm. came up with something else. I have another way I'll tell you. Later. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm actually curious about that. You, uh, you actually reduce dynamic compression, so you don't get the uh, Yeah. But isn't that part of what makes you something that? So I'm curious about that. You actually reduce dynamic compression, so you don't get the elevated sounds. But isn't that part of a narration? Inflections will sometimes be louder or... There, yes, but, but it's, it's still there. It's just leveled out, so you don't have these huge waves. So you don't that suddenly hurt on the ears. Yeah. So you don't suddenly have us talking, and then something happens. You know, because when you're recording, you are not rigid. As much as it would be wonderful if you were, you are not, and you will move a bit. So it sort of levels it. 
Um, if you have something better, I would so be happy. I was so mad when they stopped supporting the you, levelator. You'll laugh when I tell you because it's so simple. But I'll tell you okay. Um, but yeah, so there are these things you can doing the actual recording you can do on a shoestring budget. Um, pot filters, and I'm taking over, so please pop in, especially my narrators. But when you're talking into a mic, any word that has a P in it, you'll get that puff of breath in the recording. Inexpensive pop filter, you take a coat hanger, do it in a circle, put a nylon over it, so and it stops that. Hose. Yeah, <laughs> panty hose, and it stops that when you're recording. Costs you almost nothing. So you don't need room echo. Record in a clothes closet. You get rid of that room echo. Or under a blanket, you get rid of the room echo. I, I know it sounds silly, but... I built a portable recording studio, uh, voice studio, um, patterned uh, after um, one that I'd seen on YouTube for um, audio bloggers, uh, people who do po podcasts. And it is basically a, I think it's a 45 liter tote. And I've lined it with um, a mattress liner that's sort of corrugated, so it's soft, it absorbs sound. Cut a hole for my microphone to stand in the middle and then I just sit right at the front of it and read in there. That's the only brilliant. sound that comes in comes from me. That's really brilliant. That is really you, yeah. you have to tell me more about that. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, that's amazing. Brilliant. I told you know, like, like one of those like rubber, rubber made bin. Exactly. But a big one. The I big... went to Canadian Tire, I spent twenty dollars, I bought a rubber brilliant. rubber made bin and I put twenty dollars lined... worth of foam Quilts. mattress liner inside it, yeah. quilted mattress liner kind of thing. And uh, just Glued it. On the table, put it on my desk. And, and yeah. the yes. What I'd like to have is a taller desk so that I could stand. <laughs> yeah. Because sitting to read for for a long time is it gets a little. Yeah, it, I stole fine. the idea from you know. It's yes, a brilliant but idea. It, it works. And again, think, very inexpensive. Well. You do not need a majorly expensive sound studio to record, which I'm sure all of you are very happy to hear about. <laughs> yes. I'm wondering, are books submitted? Someone submits a book to... The technical stuff is all very interesting, but I was wondering how books are submitted to audio. You you know, on Audible, when we, um, we, sign, when we sign a book contract, Taiki Books, we usually option the audio book rights. Now, not all our authors want that and that's fine because they'd rather do deal it with themselves and that's fine and then i contact um narrators like i said we had the open call um, it started <laughs> with when my daughter was going to college she was with a narrator be careful about that one <laughs> and um you know the story right okay with shannon burgess which if you go don't google her yeah um, cause she was at going to college with my daughter and she was an actress and, and she was looking for portfolio work and we were looking to pay next to nothing, <laughs> <laughs> but it's something Crystal once mentioned to me. Yes, it's next to nothing. But a lot of times people will do open calls to university students and go, it'll be good experience. We don't need to pay you. <laughs> so we don't pay a lot, but we do pay something. And usually university students and the drama department, not just any, obviously we went to the drama department are happy to get some money and portfolio work and we work with them and say okay you need to watch this you know this is the type of stuff you need to look for so that's how we get our narrators and then we do they like crystal said that or tony they'll do it i give them the book they read it and then we do a contract and they'll do chapter by chapter they'll upload it to a dropbox but, I'm asking, where does the book come from? but where does the book come from in our case, it's our authors. Mm -hmm. Jim uh, is. So when you are publishing, you are publishing in digital print just like any other book? Yes. But you also do, audio. But you also do the audio too? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you go on to Audible, which is owned by Amazon, <laughs> you can, when you get around, and we'll have to tell you their secrets, because in Canada you can't do Yeah, that's Helix. And then this is the audiobook. 
How did you get it all on one disc? <laughs> That's the beauty of MP. I'm so glad somebody MP3 mentioned is, that. Yeah. I've got audiobooks that take up to 12 discs. That's because they do it at a higher compression rate. When you send it to Audible, they need a 128 compression rate. These are at 92. Yes. and So it's just lower quality. You know, I, I'm old enough that I can remember <coughs> books on tape. Oh. Cassettes yes. that you used to go yes. to the library and take out. And sometimes you would have to take out two different sets of them to get like, the whole be like book. six of them. Unless it was... I used to play mine on a Discman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. My Walkman, I'd walk around. The CDs as well. no, but CDs mine. are the same. CDs are the same as cassettes because there's only about an hour, maybe 70 minutes worth of material that you can put on a CD. Well, it took me, what, 22 hours, 23 hours? Well, Helix is about an 11 hour finished oh, book. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah, I know it, it took 20, you 20 hours, hours but, to record it. <laughs> but it's about an 11 hour finished book. So books. that's still 11 CDs that you have to pack around. Um, you know, a lot of people would abridge the audio versions, mm-hmm. and I hated that. Oh, it just drove me crazy. And so um, you would find people like Stephen King would put out his own reading of a book. And, you know, Stephen King books are chihuahua killers, I think I heard them referred to yesterday. <laughs> and they are just monster books, and so you get like 30 CDs. The stand is 60 hours. The stand is 60 hours. Yes. Exactly. So, and I got it for one credit. And I got it for one credit on Audible. But the beauty of MP3 is that you can adjust the, uh, the compression, compression rate. rate. is what it's called, yeah. Yeah, so um, to, to give you a, a frame of reference, you said 96? Uh, 128 for yeah. Audible, and these are, I think, 92. Yeah. Okay, 126 is CD quality, 92 is FM radio quality. Yeah. So you don't lose a lot of quality, but you save a ton of space by reducing it that way. And that, I think, is a, a big plus. Yeah, because these are just one gig flash drives yeah. with them on it, too. So I think mm-hmm. you have to compress them. So I am such... I, I listen to uh, books on tape all the time, or book, I still call them books on tape, audio books. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, I listen to audio books all the time. After work, I walk along the, the Memorial Drive pathway after work, and especially when the weather is good, I put on my headphones, put on my, my iPod, and I'll listen to a book while I'm walking. So, uh, Do your authors have any say in who? Do your authors have any say in who narrates their books? Not in our case. Not in ours either. If you like, if you go on Audible, say you have your book, you didn't give your book rights to your publisher, which is, you know, the audio rights, which is what we take, obviously. Um, on Audible, we're going to have to get into how Audible works for Canadians. But once you get it, yeah, I know. <laughs> you can say, this is my book. And someone and people will apply to do it. Problem well, is that's are you expensive. Are talking about ACX? ACX? ACX, which is Audible. Yeah. yeah. Problem is that's expensive. A normal audio book, minimum two thousand dollars for a voice actor if you, you, get, it if you get it professionally. And sometimes it's and or royalties. It could be more if they don't think you're going to sell. They're going to ask for more money. We don't pay that. I mean, but seriously, who can really? pay that kind of money through ACX. So you can hire out through Audible and do that. But just so you know, it's going to be expensive. And your sales will not justify that expense. Not unless you're like the George Martins or Stephen King's or whatever. Or are a marketing genius. Or a marketing mm-hmm. genius. And it's like a normal book. You still have to market it. Mm-hmm. You still have to promote it. And so when you have in your title, How to Create Your Audio Book, I does it mean I'm going out with the book that I wrote and I'm going to... So when you go out with your title, How to Create Your Audiobook, um, that doesn't mean I will necessarily be reading the book I wrote. You can. You, can. you absolutely can. It's your We book. have some of our um, authors chose to keep the audio rights, and one of them narrated it himself and put it up on, on Audible. And the reason you go through Audible is because Audible automatically goes to does iTunes as well. It's very convenient. Now. Yes. Do you find that some of your target audience is more inclined to audiobooks and some 
Do you find some of your target audience leans more towards audiobooks than printed or ebook? You know, yes and no. Um, why am I answering all the questions? Because you're answering all the questions. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> you answer it, and I'll have my own answer after this. Okay. Your your readers. My I use my husband. I don't re do audiobooks. It doesn't suit my lifestyle. But my husband travels a lot, so he's a big reader reader. But, you know, going to work, working out downstairs, because we have a, our own little workout area downstairs. He'll put on the headphones, listen to a book as he's working out. Um, I was actually interviewed for, for Westward magazine. <laughs> and they, uh, they, you know, there's also the, um, the handicapped demographic. There, you know, but it's becoming more and more popular because it's convenient too. You can just, plug it in, and especially Audible, ACX, Amazon, all the same thing, has what they call Whisper Sync now. So if you read your book word for word, and some people don't necessarily do that, I don't know why, but anyways, and you buy the audiobook through Amazon and the ebook through Amazon, you can listen to half of it in audio, and it will pick up where you left off in the ebook. You can also download it to your Kindle. You can also download it to your Kindle. Yeah. It takes up a lot of space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of libraries are switching to digital simply because they cannot afford a large amount of books anymore. And that brings to Overdrive. Overdrive and one-click digital is even better. Overdrive or one-click digital, which I find is even better. See, I tend to use library ideals because both of those you need a certain library before they'll talk to you and there are places that will consolidate you know they'll put all the small publishers together and then moat them all we haven't done that yet but that's more my time than anything else uh, we do use a place called library but that's ebooks they don't do audio unfortunately overdrive i spoke to they they gave me some names to contact i just haven't gotten to it yet because they won't talk to you as a small press unless you got a certain library number. Question, sir, I'm so sorry. You're just off in the side here. Um, what about then, you mm. can't, can't pick your narrators, what about the like relation between them? For instance, you mentioned you did the one uh, book and the author was delighted with it. Now yes. in the future, can the author say, this person gets my work, this is excellent, can we continue that for my next book? Or the author? How much say in the narration does an author get? For example, Tony did a narration and the author loved it. So if they come up with a second book, can they say, I would like to keep with this uh, narrator, or do they have a say of doing the opposite? I don't want this narrator. I give them the choice. I do give my narrators a choice. Randy's book, he's requested a certain narrator. Sorry, not you, Tony. Oh. I actually suggested you because that would be funny. He's friends with Randy. But he asked specifically for Harold, who was going to be here, because Harold does full voice acting. And I said, yeah, okay. But Harold gets right to refusal. I'm not going to. And if Harold says, no, I don't want to do that, well, then that's the way it goes. But if my author specifically asks for one of my narrators, of course I'm going to. And if it's in a series, one second, yes. If it's in a series, it's really preferable if you have the same narrator for book two or three, mm -hmm. just because, I mean, we can't do that with one's aspect, but just because sometimes you can't do that. But it is really preferable for continuity if you can get the same narrator for the next book in the series. And sometimes the author thinks they know what they want, um, but commercially, we know what they need. And so sometimes their request isn't exactly what they really need, because our goal is to sell the book whether it's in e-print, audio, we mm -hmm. want to sell it. And just because they might have a relationship with a certain narrator, they think that's who they want, that narrator might not, might not be the right person for that book. So it is a little sometimes give and take. If you know your authors really well, and I know all my authors very well, um, if I'm not sure if it's the right person for them, I'll ask them, what do you think of this person? Um, but if they offer or suggest something that I know is outright wrong for that book, I'll tell them. So this is the wrong one. This and, is the wrong one. And sometimes the, the authors do silly things too. Like we have Harold's book. He does full voice acting. So we have this young book for 12 year olds. And I know I'm not, I'm not ignoring you honest, 
But, um, and I, so I hooked him up. I thought, okay, full voice acting would be a good book for 12 year olds. And the author said, I don't want full voice acting. I just want a good narration. And we went, really? And that's when I'd say, well, I think this is what we're going to do with your book. You're just nicer than I am. I'm nicer than you are. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, but the, all the narrators and authors get each other's emails. So, as as Tony and Crystal can tell you that way, you can do pronunciations because the author knows how their books mm -hmm. are pr pronounced or better than I would. Or they make it up faster. Or they make it up faster. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm so sorry. Um, just something completely different. I have the notion that I wanted to read children's stories, like bedtime stories. So how would I do that? So I have the notion that I'd like to read children's stories, like bedtime stories or something like that, and put them on the internet. How would I go about doing that? Over the internet? You know, YouTube is amazing. You don't have to do video, but they will just do audio too. And you can upload. You do have to make sure you have the rights to those books to read them, though. You know, you can't just read a book because there are copyright infringements. No, okay. Yeah. There are ways... We will now discuss Audible. Might as well. Everybody's asking about the 800-pound gorilla. You can do it to Audible. Our 12-year-old book is up to Audible. So would I then, how would I record it? How would I record it? You record it like normal um, with, say, Audacity or however. You have a, all these tips they gave you, microphones, whatever. You need a recording program, something that's... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And there are ones... Yeah. yeah. And there are expensive ones. I mean, Apple has um, Garage, GarageBand, yeah. mm -hmm. but you pay for that one. We we like we know what you know, especially aspiring authors are. Cheap is better, so we're quite you know. Amazon, Audible, iTunes. And then similar to what a singer would do, she wanted to put her her voice out on. Facebook or whatever. And then similar to what a singer would do if she made a recording and then wanted to put it out on Facebook or wherever. Yeah, she would, normally they'd link to YouTube. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. They get the proper equipment. We are not doing singing qualities. It is slightly different and, tech, and probably they don't go for the cheap thing suggestions we've been making. Do you want to start with Amazon? <laughs> What would you like to talk about? Amazon Audible. Audible. When Legends. you're in Canada, if you live in the U.S. or the U.K., mm -hmm. Amazon, Amazon has this great thing. You're independent. You sign up. It's free. As if you're buying a book, ebook, you sign up, and you have this oh, yes. thing, and you can just upload your audio. Yep. It's called ACX, mm -hmm. the Audible, Audible Exchange. Creative Exchange, Exchange or something yeah. like that. Yeah. ACX.com. Fantastic program for especially independent uh, authors or in uh, self-published authors who are trying to get their work um, into audio because you can go um, upload your book and and accept uh, auditions or you can go looking for a producer that way um, you can hire uh, via royalty you can pay a fee I mean there's lots of options but they don't like Canadians so it's really, if you're going that route, you have to find workarounds to be able to use their program. And I found a great workaround. Yes, we got it from Ellen. I'm going to... Does it make a difference? Like, I have dual citizenship. I have dual citizenship, so does that mean I can use it? You have to have an address and a U.S. banking account. So your U.S. account and your U.S. banking address or U.S. mail address. Now we... That's the problem. Did you try to go through the proper channels through Audible? Yes. We did. They want a minimum five books. They are not... They do not tell you what they... Like when we went through it, they do not answer their emails. You might no. get an answer six or eight months later mm. when you make a query. They will not give you... If you go onto the ACX website, you will. they will tell you how that you, they want the book in mono 128 compression and all that. When you contact them through Canada, they don't tell you any of that. No. The, they're really difficult to work with. You have to have a minimum of five audio books. Five? I was told ten. I was told five. Oh. They don't their standards. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
there are places in the States who know how stupid Audible is, so they will be your address. Middleman. Your middleman. Um, they usually charge, the ones Ellen and I go through charges 10% of the royalties. Not bad, because, I mean, your royalties are all in U.S. funds. And then you send them an invoice for whatever your royalty is, less 10%, and they pay you through pay- PayPal. Really good. So they're your address. But they set it up in such a way you get full control. They don't know yeah. your password. They don't know anything. They're just your address and banking info. They're just, yeah, they're the, the banking people. And that, so you're cheating the system. You are. You're pretending you... Yeah, mm-hmm. same idea. They're not cheating the system. No. They're agenting. They're just That's being, yeah, they're exactly. They're being the agents. Agents. No, I meant yeah. we are cheating, not... Well, yes Yeah, I no. guess no. But yeah, <laughs> so you have to work around it because if you live in Canada and want to go on Audible, who has an exclusive contract with iTunes, so if you want your books on iTunes... You have to do it, yeah. And that Audible is Amazon. I know we say ACX and Audible. It's Amazon. It's all the same company, just to clarify. You need to go work, do a workaround. And if you have want to know these workarounds and whatnot, feel free to email either um, Ellen or myself, and we can get you in t- contact with the one we use. Can you talk about the range or difference needed between narrating and stage acting? Repeat the question in the mic. So what the difference is between stage acting and reading a book, the range of, of characters and... No, I mean the way the voices come out differently. Well, the levels, that can all be done in post afterwards. So, so is there anything similar to that? How far you can go with particular parts of the story? So is there anything to um, how far you can go with your voice? I don't, gen- I mean, I generally try not to go, like, actual shouting. Um if somebody shouts in the book, I'll express that, but not necessarily like I'm not going to actually shout into the microphone because then poor Rhea is going to have her ears blasted with, and it also, with that. There's something called clipping. If you go beyond the microphone's range, it gets really... It gets cut. The, yeah. So, so it sounds It sounds weird. awful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if a character laughs, do you laugh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I um, I mean, not necessarily. I'm not going to go into a full throated, you know, long chuckle or anything. But yeah, I will. I will. You know, if the character is laughing while they're saying something, I'll usually do that. Um, I don't do full voice acting. Um, I do primarily, as as Rhea said, narration. Um, but what I try to do is each character in my head has kind of a flavor to their voice. So I try to add that quality so that it's maybe not fully different, but slightly different from from different characters. Um, and yeah, if there's if there's a dramatic moment and somebody is shouting, I do try to add emphasis emphasis to that. Um, or if they're laughing, or if they're whispering, or even stammering, like it'll say yeah. he stammered. So so and I'll stammer. stammer. Yeah. In- She'll have still have to say he stammered because otherwise it won't sync up to the ebooks. But yeah, if he's if he's think, going but but he's then it said but he stammered. You go but but but, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely. Uh, Do you agree? Yes. Yeah, it, which is why it's important to read to read before you actually get to that part. Why do you do narration only and not full voice acting? Um, it's just not something I've done yet. Um, you can. I won't stop you. Yeah. Uh, it does take, in a lot of ways, it does take a lot well, more work. More um, because you have to, as she pointed out, you have to remember that this character speaks with this voice and this character speaks with that voice. And if you mix them up later down the road, you're going to have to re-record that but whole section. But I do section. have one per- person who does full voice acting, what he'll do is at as in his first read through, he will do a file of, you know, so and so's talk talks like this and so and so talks like this. So he can go back and listen to 
his original script, as it were, and, and try to match it. Mm -hmm. That's very smart. Yes? What about the, the cross, uh, the gender stuff, like for instance? What about the gender differences when they're narrating? They do their best. Some are better than others. <laughs> I find that um, like females who read a male voice will often lower their voice just an octave. Yeah. Would you say? Just so that you can tell that it's a different. Yeah. Um, at least my narrators seem to do that. Yeah, I don't know exactly do how too. they do. Um, and male readers will sometimes, you know, make their voice a little bit different for the female characters. Pitch it a little bit higher. Yeah. What I try to do when I choose my narrators, if it's a male protagonist, I tend to get a male narrator. Try him. If it's a female protagonist, I tend to get... And there's still both sexes in a book, no matter who your protagonist is. But I do try to match that way, uh, especially if it's a first-person book, obviously. <laughs> I kind of, in my head, I think of it as the protagonist is the narrator, and so I try and read it as she would hear that character speak. So it's not exactly necessarily how that character speaks, but it's it's her impression of it, if that makes sense. So it's still her voice. That's how I think of it. Everybody, okay. It reminds me of a quick question, I think. So you were saying, for example, in the book uh, Stammered, mm -hmm. so do you correct that he said, or he stammered? Does, is there a narration voice versus the character? Like uh, You were talking about um, when someone stammered, you'll say the sentence and then say he stammered. Do you correct the, is there a narration voice versus a character voice? There usually is unless it's first person. I know a lot of my narrators, the, the ones that do full voice acting, you know, if it's a guy, he'll go, but, but, but he said. You know, if it's a girl, he'll go, but, but, but he said. You know, you still have to have the word he said in there or it won't sync up. I know some audiobooks, because if it's full voice acting, they'll take out the word he said, because obviously he said it. But then it doesn't sync up properly in the whisper sync. So, so you do have to keep the, the narration part in it, even if it really is silly. If you're having a conversation between two people, there's two different voices. You don't need the he said, she said, but you need it for that. That answers some of the questions about how my audiobooks are, are narrated. <laughs> <laughs> and there was another one here. Yes. I was just My question is why you don't use multiple actors so that you have male voices and female voices. Um, we've never had any like that yet. Not to say that we couldn't, but that gets really expensive, expensive when you have multiple actors and multiple voices. Hard to listen to as well. Hard to listen to as well. Sometimes it really it's is. Hard. You get used to those single voices. So all, all women being man or kid or a man. When you have two, it's like it's like another book. It's very, I find it very distracting. It can be hard to listen to as well. Um, you will get used to listening to a single voice, being man, woman, kid, and all of them. And then when suddenly another voice chimes in, it can also be a little distracting. And another thing to think of when you're recording, you know, I gave that, that ex example of going up the hill versus up the hall. Do not just record the one word. Continuity be wrong. So record the whole sentence. If you're correcting it. If you you're correcting yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. If you just say, you know, he went up the hill and I send it back and say, okay, change it to hall. If you just send me the word hall... You can tell it's been cut in. It sounds yeah. really awkward. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes even the whole sentence you can sort of tell, depending upon what's going on in the background behind them at the time even. But yeah, at least record the whole sentence. Sometimes I'll get a whole paragraph back just for continuity of the sound. Mm -hmm. um, and yet things will happen. A really good thing is listen to it after. Because, you know, say a plane went overhead, you wouldn't consciously notice it. But it will get picked up in the recording. So if you just record it, okay, it was good. And then I send it back and I have done that. Oh, there's something tinging in the background. And you wouldn't even notice it because you tune these things out when you're doing your own stuff. So a good Although I will say I've picked up more since I started having the headphones that are plugged yeah. into the mic. 
because I'm listening to it as I'm saying as I'm saying so it. You, so you're, you're hearing it. I'm hearing it as I as I record it. It's kind of awesome actually but because I definitely like caught using? a few. What are you using? Uh, it's called a Shure. So oh. it's S H U R E yes. is the yeah, the brand. Familiar. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it plugs right into my laptop. I've got a USB adapter, and then I can plug the headphones right into the... Okay, before we answer the one last question, we are running out of time. There was a bowl going around. I don't know where it is. If you put your name in it, we're giving away some of our audiobooks. Everybody put their names in? Just name. We're not collecting data. Unless you want to get our email address, our, our, our new releases email, then you put your email address on it. But we're just collecting data. Okay, we had one last question, and then we're going to do this. I'm curious about how you get, how the readers read without having, like, you know, you're turning the page. I'm curious about how the readers read and the microphone doesn't pick up them turning the page. Do you know electronic format is amazing? Oh, I use my phone. Here's it right on my phone. So you're able to scroll without turning yeah. pages, right? And, just and Tony the reads page. on his Kindle? Yeah. I, I read on a Kobo. Kobo. Um, it's, I have... Uh, Kobo Glow, which is backlit, and as I said, I have that portable little yeah, uh, mm -hmm. vocal booth that I use. Um, it provides its own light inside, so I, I... Yeah, so you can record in that closet, which is usually yeah. dark, to, to do the sound muffling, but you have a lit thing with you. Mm -hmm. The disadvantage to doing it um, mm -hmm. electronically is that you can't mark up the copy. And I'm old school. I've been in radio for 35 years. I learned uh, to read. You know, you you just scribble all over the copy. You use a highlighter and, and all of those kinds of things. You can't do that in a Kobo. Well, if I, you I, ask I me, we get we would like for our narrators. If they asked, I would give them a paper copy. I, but I wouldn't be able to use it in the, the book. Exactly. I'm using. There's not enough space to or light pages, even. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a little bit of a a hindrance to me, but I've, I've adapted to it. Mm. This was a great session. Good. Did you guys learn enough? And if you email you. any of us, we will be glad to answer questions. Tony and Crystal, just email Tyke Books. Go to our website, and I, I'll make sure they get it. Ellen is with Champagne Books, and we've, we've got booths in the dealer's room. So you can come and talk our ear off, too, some more. And I'm at Tyke Books in the dealer's room. So if you have Enjoy questions. Okay. Yeah, keep going.